put up your sword. The enemy is still out there. The question now is where? It is over. You have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen. What I have seen. So to start here, given that Shadow of the Past is the name of the very first episode, can you both tease how the Shadow of the Past looms over your characters and also how they're reacting to it to start at least? So I think Halbrand's past is lingering in his mind um, and it has been for quite a long time in his life. And I think the series picks up for him at the point where he's cutting it off and he's saying, I don't want anything to do with my past. I'm, I'm going to move away from it. I'm going to start a new life, start a fresh life. And then he runs into uh, you know, Galadriel and a few things change. Yeah. Um, Gladriel is still reeling from having lost her brother Finrod, who was slain by Morgoth. This is a brother that she should have had forever and ever and ever. Um, and she's convinced that they haven't, the damage hasn't been fixed, the darkness hasn't been snuffed out just yet. Okay, so that's that's where they start. They intersect early on. Can you can you each tell me something? about the other character that your character needs? Like for example, something about Galadriel that's really important for Halbrand to have in his life right now and vice versa. I think I think when Halbrand sees Galadriel, he, whether or not I think I'll leave it open to interpretation as to if he knows exactly who she is. I have an answer, but I think he knows that, what he does know is that there's something special about her and he sees an opportunity and potentially a way out of the predicament that he's in. Mm. It, 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 when he meets her, it's life or death for him. He's on a raft and he's probably going to die without help. Um, and she provides an opportunity of solace and safety. Yeah, and I think for Gladiol, it's slightly similar. She, much to her surprise and like the surprise of everyone because uh. she's Gladiol, she <laughs> finds herself needing help, um, which is very new for her. Um, and... Halbrand happens to be there. Um, it's it's a meeting that shouldn't have happened, mm. and somehow it does. I always like digging into shows and movies after seeing them, but you're all doing a really good job of teasing what's to come and hyping <laughs> me up even more than I was before. Uh, Morpeth, given that we have seen Galadriel in the films, can you name one thing about Kate Blanchett's performance that you really wanted to include in your own portrayal to kind of connect the dots? But then what's something that you deliberately strove to do different to further convey that she is a, at a different point in her life right now? Okay, um, so I think the thing I definitely wanted to include and the thing that terrified me when I first saw those films is that Gladriel can be terrifying should she choose to. She's mm -hmm. lethal. Um, and so I really wanted to have that element of that this is someone choosing not to use the power that they have badly. Um, and then something that is very different about the Gladriel of the Second Age is things are about to happen that she couldn't comprehend. and one of those is the rings and the rings really show the elves that they are corruptible in a way that I don't think they could completely comprehend before. I can't wait to see more. So <laughs> Charlie, for you, you get to play an entirely original character here. And I've got to imagine that is super exciting, but also maybe a little daunting given how beloved these characters and the world are. So what is something about your portrayal of him that, is something new to this world that you're really excited for viewers to see for the very first time, but then also what's something that you strove to do so that he feels like, I guess, like a natural extension of the pre-existing world that everyone has known from before. Yeah, so I, I think the beauty of Hal is that he he's built upon the foundations of, of Tolkien, right? Mm -hmm. So the showrunners and the writers did such a fantastic job in creating a character that already has so many uh tolkien themes built in already and drawn from he he's really in touch with nature and his craft and, and a whole bunch of things that already exist in tolkien um as far as bringing something new i think what we tried to go in a slightly different direction in terms of 
his voice and a bit of characterization and, and physicalization. We were working with the amazing Leith McPherson, who is who is an incredible linguist and dialect coach on this show. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's some interesting things going on there. There was a time when the world was so young. There had not yet been a sunrise. But even then, there was light. All right, Maximum, I'm coming your way first. So the showrunners have compared Isildur to Michael Corleone from The Godfather. So other than him being the son of this situation, what is it about him that makes him the Michael of the family? Oh, he is, um, I guess in a way, he is trying to do the right thing, which is fit into society and follow his father's footsteps and uh become do, do the societal norm but there's something in him that is unsettled and restless that makes him want to escape want to leave and he there's a romantic notion in him about leaving and escaping and seeing the world for himself i think it's like a coming of age story uh in a way um and he makes a lot of mistakes on the way um but then he 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 has a lot of conviction in, in in whatever he's doing. Okay, I mean, don't we all make some mistakes along the way? He makes a pretty big mistake eventually, though. Well, maybe it'll be perceived that the mistake that he might make, you'll understand it, and you'll be rooting for him, and you'll see it as a tragedy, and you'll be like, no, you know, rather than like, idiot. Okay, I'm open-minded. I'll, I'll accept that tease and roll with it for now. Uh, Lloyd, how about for you? Is Elendil comparable to Vito at all? What, what is his approach to being the patriarch of the family like? Well, I was just saying, if that's true about, um, about Corleone, that makes me Brando, right? <laughs> so, uh, I'm taking that. I'm taking it. I might talk like that a little bit in this interview. Um, Pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> That can, you keep, can you keep doing that? Then? Yeah, look, look, my claim to my current claim to fame is I am 38th great 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 grandfather of Vigo Mortensen as Aragorn, right? Well, Aragorn himself. So the family line is good. The looks, uh, the looks do pass down. The looks yeah. pass down. Yeah. And then it stopped at Isildur and sadly. it went at the end of it like his mother. It, it skipped one, end. yes. Um, <laughs> look, tremendous responsibility to play this role because. He's, you know, he's mentioned throughout the Lord of the Rings. The book is there and, and there's so many references back to him. So, but great excitement because there are only ultimately signposts that Tolkien has written on the way to who this man is. But we have to understand that he's going to end up helping to lead the last alliance of elves and men. How does he get there from the position? And I think in his case, like, like so many of Tolkien's themes, it's the hero's journey in the sense that he does not want to be the man that is asked to take on that amount of responsibility so how does he how does he swallow his his fear and his pride to step forward and what does he have to sacrifice to get there in terms of family and that's what the showrunners have set up brilliantly with our with our family here i'm so eager to dig into the layers of that so now emma for you you get an exciting opportunity with a brand new character here so can you give us a little tease of what the dynamic is like between her her brother and her father Yes, I mean, I, I play Aeadian and she's the baby of the family. Um, and she's, we meet her at a point in her life where she's kind of juggling her own ambition. She's quite smart and, and capable, um, but of course on the cusp of womanhood, so still quite naive and insecure. Um, we were raised by a single father um, and she's, she's trying desperately to fill the mother-shaped hole um, and be a be a bit of a mum to her older mm, yeah need mum but <laughs> but more troubled uh brother um yeah oh, also and, sorry <laughs> and because of the fact that she's in this mother role that she does feel a bit overlooked by her father um which makes her quite vulnerable to attention from other places it's a lot to work with right now we also know that she's I believe an artist and a, an aspiring architect and designer. So can you tell us a little bit about what inspired those passions in her and what she also strives to do with them? Well, her mother, her mother drew quite significantly. My, you know, my, my main prop in the show is, is, an, is a notebook filled with her drawings that she's, that I've sort of, you know, um, 
become obsessed with and I'm, and I'm using to fill with my own drawings. The beautiful thing about Numenorians and the thing we, we as a people <laughs> take mm -hmm. most pride in is the fact that we, our whole nation was created with, with our own hands and our own minds um, in contrast to the elves who have access to, you know, long life and, you know, uh, you know, yeah. Anyways, um, they have given us the odd skill, which we'll have to say that they. Yes, did, they they've they've gifted us health and and poetry, and intelligence, and poetry. She's going yeah. to renovate. <laughs> she's going to renovate Numenor, so it's it's pretty exciting. She's designing season two, <laughs> frankly. At the minute, she's just doing the interior design to the flat, uh -oh. but soon to be bigger scale. At the minute, I mean, she's got her fingers crossed that she'll make an apprentice, you know, apprenticeship somewhere. I mean, this is all what I figured. I figured you're going to build all the sets for season two now, right? <laughs> correct, correct. No, but the point is that the, the Numenorean, Numenorean society is incredibly egalitarian. Uh, there's like a town square. Anyone can speak up politically. Anyone can say whatever they, look, they like. There are all of these various guilds for all of these various skills. And women are allowed in those guilds and they're in certain positions within society. And so that's reflective again of Aeon's position, right? All right, I dig it. So Maxima, I'm, com I'm coming back to this because obviously a very big question here, but given that we know what Isildur does, it does feel necessary to ask this. With what he does ultimately with the ring, is that something that you have to block out while playing him in season one? Or are you actively, I guess, planting the seeds for him to make that decision in the future? I think that's a question for down the line. It's more of a question for the for the viewer as well, watching him, observing him, seeing the choices that he makes as a young adult. How does that influence him later on down the line? Um, I know that that I, I I definitely wanted to to create a character that was very relatable, that someone that you could watch and see yourself in. Um, a lot of the problems that he faces, I think maybe you would have faced at some point in life, you know? Um, and it, he's someone who's emotional as well. Someone who uh, thrives off feeling that, that doesn't necessarily, necessarily think rationally about the choices that he's doing. And in the process, he loses things along the way. Also, I think, I mean, I think just that it's got, always has to be pointed out that if, 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 uh, if Gollum wasn't there, would Frodo have done the, uh, done the same as Isildur? Yeah. I think you have to answer yes. It's an especially exciting creative challenge to have to be able to play a character with everybody watching the show, knowing where he winds up. So I am excited it's, it's to dig how, into the nuance the you just explained. He, it's almost the interesting thing is the how, you know, we all know what happens, but it's the how does it happen? It will be the end, not just of our people, but all peoples. Sorry, but their time has come. So obviously there is a good deal of secrecy around this series in general, but it does feel like that's especially strong with your character. So it was make, <laughs> it making me wonder, at what point did you fully find out who you'd be playing in the series? And then also have either of you come close to slipping and revealing any secrets yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's such a relief to be able to talk about them because I've been fit to burst, to be quite honest with you, for the past year. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it was, um, when did we find out? When did we That's find a good out about question them? because it wasn't during the audition process, you know? So, you know, when it came to casting, uh, you know, all of the characters had aliases, which they continued to have throughout the production. So you had to remember a person's name, their alias, their other alias, you know, it was a lot of, you know, uh, mystery around that. So I, I remember having an alias. I remember having sides that were sort of vague and, and written specifically just for audition purposes. And I believe even when I was cast, I still didn't fully know you know, the sort of who exactly I was playing. Um, I, it might have been when I got to New Zealand. Mm. But I, I mean, I, you know, it really was one of those things where I didn't, I just knew I was part of the show. And, and that in and of itself was a triumph and, and exciting. It was like, great, I'm going to, you know, we'll, we'll find out when we get there, like what's, what's going on. So um, once I had a better understanding of who I was playing, um, 
well, then suddenly it was like, oh, well, okay. Um, and I benefit my, my sort of, uh, my secret weapon. My husband is a massive Tolkien fan, huge. So even when I sort of said the name, you know, it's, you know, he sort of connected the dots and, and then it was like, oh, okay. <clears throat> well, wow. That's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Yeah. I did a lot of detective work. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, yeah. And then, then <laughs> so I thought, oh, it's this. So we were, you know, when you talk to people, you know, on uh, like JD, Patrick and everybody, you'd be going, so about this and about that. And like, how does, how does he know? But we, we all kind of, we all, okay, we won't, we won't mention any names. So we'll just, <laughs> how do we go about getting this character then? You know, so yeah, I've done a little bit of detective work. And so, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd managed to deduce that uh, who I was playing. <laughs> I was also pretty good about holding on to the secret as well, because, you know, being in New Zealand was a benefit because you're literally physically removed from, you know, your people. And when I left for New Zealand, I just told everyone I'm going somewhere. Can't say where. It'll all be clear soon. It'll all make sense. Um, but even once people knew I was working on Lord of the Rings, um, you know, there were a lot of guesses. A lot of people thought I would, they asked me about my ears. A lot of people were like, T do you have, do you have pointy ears? And I, I just smiled coyly and, you know, I just said, I'll, I'll you'll see soon enough. But so. you could as well, but also as well, when I was doing my detective work, you have such a lovely sort of energy, you know, you walk with grace, this kind of yeah. ethereal quality. So I thought, Okay. Yeah, you could be. Uh, you can yeah, look who you no, are. I, you know, you, you're the I queen. Be an elf. It could be like you know, dry ice <laughs> as you glide along the floor there. But uh... <laughs> I'm gonna write that into, yeah. into the next season. Gliding. I imagine finally being able to share the news was well worth the wait for both of you. Oh, definitely. definitely. Yes, absolutely. Of course, we know Muriel and Farazan are pretty major characters in the history of Numenor. So can you tease exactly where we find them at the very beginning of the series? What are some of their personal top priorities and chief concerns when episode one opens up? So Farazan is the uh, cousin to Queen Muriel, who is the Queen Regent. So Tar Palant Palantir, uh, your father is still king, but he's ill. So uh, Muriel is, is running Numenor. I'm her consul, her right-hand man. So it is for me to make sure that the relationship between Regency and the people of Numenor runs smoothly. So it's all about, as far as I'm concerned, social cohesion. And so we find Numenor at the peak of its power. There's little discrepancies. You have the faithful, people who are faithful to the traditions, the old Elvish traditions. And then you have uh, what I like to say, the innovators, the modernists, the people who want to take uh, and trailblaze uh, Numenor down a path which celebrates their roots as men and where they're going as a race of men. And I think that's where Farazon is. He sees himself as a modernist, uh, being a man, He's, he's mortal, so he's burdened by his own mortality. So for him, legacy is everything. And when you see Numenor, when you see the, I mean, the epic scale of the place, it's almost as if you're taking a journey through Farazon's mind. You know, it's all about legacy, pride that kind of bleeds into hubris at times. And I think for Miniel, you know, there's that difficult position of wanting to maintain the peace and stability that Numenor is in when we first sort of are introduced to this world, but there are rumblings, you know, there is that sense that people are kind of unsure about her, unsure about the way forward. And so you do see these sort of two ideas of tradition versus modernization or progress sort of uh, clash and, and sort of how these characters then make the decisions that they make uh, and do so for the fate of their people, really. So excited to dig into that more. <laughs> I'm not sure if something like this is, is helpful for both of you when you tackle new roles, but are there any, I guess, like historical figures or even past movie or television characters that you can draw some inspiration from to further craft these characters beyond what you get from the source material? Absolutely. Every time any anybody that's in any position of power, whether they're in the past, whether it's ancient Rome, whether it's the British, the French Empire, um, the Russian Empire, whether it's uh, to do with anything or even uh, today, modern politics, you know, you, you take from everything, you sponge everything up, you know, you you just drink it all in and just let that see where it goes, see where it takes you. 
Yeah, I think there's historical research, but there's also that emotional research and trying to really think around, you know, what do people who who actually find themselves in positions of power, how how does that sort of uh, affect them on a personal level, mm -hmm. on an emotional level, and trying to sort of, you know, find the truth in that because even if you you cannot relate to being uh, a, a leader or being royal, you can relate to the isolation around, you know, what it is to sort of be the only person tasked with with huge decisions and how those decisions ultimately will affect other people. So I think there was both looking at history, obviously always referring back to Tolkien's writing, hmm. and then thinking about what would I do if if this were me in this situation, and what how have I felt in the past about certain certain ideas or certain things so you know we draw from all the the sources that we can and and just put it all out there through these characters all right i'll wrap with this one here so we know that your relationship is super important to the series but who would you say is influencing the two of their of them their journeys the most at the very beginning of the show other than the two of them <laughs> okay other than the two of them what is what is um that's that's a really good question um i think I think for Farazon, it is it is the people. And when you, and oh, that that's not a cop out. That is a genuine answer, by the oh, way. No, I'm, I'm with you. It's 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 the people of Numenor. So uh, when you 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 will see the people of Numenor, and you'll see what they mean to him. And I think this is a man who, without without them, without everything that he sees, that he he surveys, you know that 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 is him. That is everything about him. The people. The the, play, the 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 masonry that you see, the, the 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 fleet that they have of ships, you know everything. So when you um, in the Undying Tales, when you read about uh, there's a chapter about like the uh, description of Numenor. It's as if you're seeing it fra through the eyes of a Numenorean. That's the pride that they have. Look how beautiful this is. Look how great that we did this, because you know elves don't have to worry about what they build and their legacy you know they can live forever and they can be at one maybe in sympathetical with with nature and the earth whereas men they're not going to be around forever so they need to make a lasting impact and i think the people and what Numenor is that influences him and that's what's important to him and i would say for queen miriel i would say her lineage you know there is her father before her and his father before him and his mother before him. And there are certain worldviews that inform her worldview, but at the same time, she's trying to sort of be her own, her own person. So it's that thing of your parents have, have taught you and you've understood lessons that they've tried to impart, but you wanna make your own sort of choices uh, you know, for the here and now. So I, I think, again, I'm, I'm sort of speaking in a, in a slightly vague way, but, you know, without sort of spoiling anything, just to, to say that I think, you know, her lineage before her very much informs how she wants to proceed and, and define herself as a leader. Our days of peace begin. We thought our joys would be unending. We thought our light would never dim. The skies are strange. At this point in his life, what would you say is Gilgalad's greatest strength? But then also, what do you think his greatest weakness is that he needs to overcome in episode one early on? Ooh, great question. Um, I'd say one of his greatest strengths, it's, it's true in all the writings that he, he is ahead of the curve in the anticipation of evil. He's, he's deeply suspicious and wary, and he kind of has this elvish spidey sense to sense the tentacles of evil surging beneath the crust of the earth. You know, he, he's the one who can uh, see it coming. And I think it's that's probably uh, double edged for him in that he's ever aware, ever vigilant. But at the same time, it it makes him distracted and makes him uh, kind of clamp down on those around them that are also beginning their uh, journeys that lead to their destiny. So I, I think that it's it's one and the same. 
you know, to be aware is a gift, but also it can um, make you make mistakes. I did want to dig into that whole Spidey sense thing a little bit. What it, What is it about his past and his experiences that you think him, that you think give him that ability to detect evil like that versus others out there who can't? Um, well, it, it's experience, you know, thousands and thousands of years of seeing everyone you know and love die and the inevitable resurrection of evil. Um, how do you, in spite of that, still muster the strength to have hope? And that's unique to him. But at the same time, um, it it must weigh on him all the time. You know, it's it's the ability to hear frequencies that others can't. It must be maddening. And also when you can sense evil and everyone's having a party, it must be infuriating you know, that, that, that it's um, when people start taking peace for granted, um, whether it's in Tolkien or in television or in the, the world at large, that's when we really get into trouble. And I think Gil Galad understood that in a deeply profound way. So I'm sure some of that might be very frustrating for him to experience, but he has one quality that really stands out that I love so much. It's this idea that he brings out the best in everyone around him. And, you know, it does feel like a skill that everyone today could benefit from learning more about. So how exactly does he go about doing that for the people around him? Well, uh, take his relationship with Elrond, for example. Um, he, not to sound condescending, but he he does kind of parent him in the way a truly loving parent would, which is to encourage you to be your better self and uh, provide you a structure with, within which you have freedom. You know that he's he's loving and brave enough to let Elrond make mistakes, and also it it's the way a parent can manipulate you to be your better self. Um, like in any loving relationship, you want to bring out the best in each other, like you just said. But sometimes to do that, you have to convince the other person it was their idea. Life lesson that can apply to this show and every single sure, thing yeah, out there. Fun. I love it. So obviously we're going to get the opportunity to explore many different settlements in this show. So what is it about his kingdom that makes it stand out from the others? What are some of its defining factors? Well, Four elves, works of beauty, their language, music, their architecture, they are, in a sense, weapons against evil. If you imagine Lindon being this beacon of light, uh, constantly searching in the darkness for where evil is hiding, that, that the more beauty they put into the universe, the slower the rebirth of, of evil becomes. And uh, I think he really believes that. And and the elves are that powerful that their music, uh, the way they carry themselves and the way they preserve and uh, adorn Middle Earth is a manifestation of good against evil. And right, I got to touch on to see that in all of its splendor. I got to touch on the scale and scope of the show as well here. So sure. you've obviously been on some pretty big sets over the years. I just mentioned in the heart of the sea at the beginning. What is it about the production process on the Rings of Power that's specific to this show? Something that with even all your experience, you've never seen something made this particular way. One of my first days on set, there were 200, 300,000 hand cut painted silk leaves on the ground. And you'd, you'd pick one up and, and I don't mean like they spray painted them. I mean, these were all individually painted. They all had a little life of their own. I knew there had been meetings about size, shape. There had been options that had been discarded. And now these are the ones they settled on and here they are in all of their glory. Um, the, the attention to detail and the army of artists and craftspeople that have been brought together to bring this to life has been exhilarating and humbling at the same time. Um, I'm not saying that on other projects, we don't have people who come together who are the best of the best, uh, but I've never seen it on this scale. And I've never um, felt that in every department, we're 
all unified with one vision, which is telling Tolkien's story as close to what we imagine that he would have wanted, that we're doing justice to it and showing respect and contributing to the love that we already feel about his work and that um, we know that fans have had for years. Eventually one or the other must surely break. You have been told many lies of Middle-earth. So to kick us off here, we know the Harfoots are ancient ancestors of the Hobbits. So can you guys give us a sense of what life is like for them and maybe how it differs from what we know of the Hobbits? Yeah, so I mean... Physically, the hobbits have, you know, they share similarities with the halffoots. You know, they both have the big feet and they have the ears and that's quite, that will be quite familiar. But I think that, um, I think the difference lies, or the main difference at least lies in their circumstances. So the hobbits have the Shire and they have that as their home, whereas the halffoots are still, you know, they're a nomadic community and they're still navigating, finding a, a stable sense of place and their home. So that's kind of the main, the main disparity, I'd say. And um and, you know, we yeah, migrate with the seasons and uh, we're filled with a lot of, of love and joy and heart. We're really united because of our circumstances and our vulnerability um, to the world around us and the environment. And so, yeah, we're just, I mean, the halfwits, not we, <laughs> but the halfwits are just navigating all of that. Very you well. You take said. a little of your character with you now, so you could say we too. Thank you. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. so- Given the given the links that you just named there, were there any opportunities to kind of draw inspiration from some of the hobbits that we've seen before in terms of Nori and Poppy's individual personalities, but also your connection to one another and your friendship? I think it was really nice to sort of have that them in context to sort of like understand the world that Tolkien had created. But I mean, for me at least, because they're not canon characters, I was able to really build Poppy from the ground upwards. Um, and I was able to really feel her in my bones um, sort of through movement and through um, our dialect and not to mention like the costumes and the hair and makeup, just like the whole transformation. Um, and then also, you know, getting to work with Markella, like the bond that we have is so strong and, you know, like we, we just work really well together. Um, yeah, we were able to really explore that, especially being in New Zealand, um, being in a place where we sort of had to become each other's support systems. Um, yeah, no, it was, yeah, really exciting. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> I, lo- I love hearing that. I'm I'm a, a big believer in the value of a strong scene partner. And to me, that's what you yeah. just described there, which seems mm. vital to their friendship in the show. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, we, yeah, we didn't, we didn't have a, a chemistry test and we kind of just met like a month before filming and yeah, very grateful that we we get on. <laughs> I love to hear it. So Markella, of course, a big thing at the beginning of the show is their encounter with this mysterious stranger. Poppy's got some apprehension when approaching him, but Nori doesn't. Right, so what, so. <laughs> where does that come from? What is it that's drawing her to him then? Well, so I think Nori, Nori, Nori I mean you know she's she's a tricky one but she's a really resolute and curious inquisitive half she just wants to subvert half tradition and I really wanted to ground her in that instead of it just being a, a, a curiosity purely for selfish reasons I wanted it to be I think it would have been really I just didn't want it to be easy in the sense that you know she's she's obviously young and and I didn't want it to come across as as naive and the writing was so brilliant that it didn't do that but I just wanted to really lean into the idea that she wants to find a way to improve the quality of life for the half community and that kind of leads her to adventure as well and she kind of leads with the idea that the fear of risk can be greater than the risk itself sometimes so to to go with that and push with that so I think it's what draws her I mean There'd be so many times where I'd read the script and just be like, why just go and do this on your own? Why dragging other people, other than, you know, popping into your mess? Just let her be. But um, I do think that it's, it's, she thinks it's for the greater good and she really does have the best of intentions. Um, And I think that's kind of what, what draws her. She just is so, has such an an innate curiosity and, you know, for the unknown and, and that's, 
what initially draws her to the stranger and to that setting. With that in mind, obviously these two characters have a lot of growing to do over the course of the series. Can you each name their greatest strength, but also their greatest weakness when we first meet them in the show? As in for each other or for our own characters? I kind of like the idea of flipping it around, but maybe to, to make it easier for your yeah. own characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Poppy's greatest, oh no, I don't know. Greatest strength and then greatest weakness. Yeah. I think uh, her weakness is food. <laughs> she sees a berry, she stops, she eats. Um, <laughs> I think her greatest strength. Very relatable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think her greatest strength is, I mean, she just has so much loyalty and love for her friend, which actually can also be a weakness too, mm. in the sense that sort of Poppy's, drive through the series is definitely navigated by Nori and the decisions that Nori makes mm. um, and Poppy feels that it's safer to keep her safe the community safe and Nori safe to keep her by her side and just look out for her so I think probably yeah the loyalty and love that she has for Nori can definitely equal equate to both yeah yeah, I would, I would say that Nori's rebellion is probably her strength and her hubris. I think that it's kind of, I think that there's, you have to sacrifice something when you're rebelling against something, right? So I think for her, it's, it's, she, even though she has the best of intentions, she can put other people in, in danger and put other people at risk. And so I think um, that that can be, that can be frustrating sometimes because you can see what she's trying to do but she's just not, she's still learning and growing and, and doesn't have um, full awareness of, of, of the consequences of her decisions um, and her decision-making sometimes. So I think, yeah, I think her rebellion can be both as well. Find the light and the shadow will not find you. Together we can survive this. Fight with me. Each of us must decide who we shall be. So your characters share a forbidden relationship in it. Why are elf human relationships looked at that way? And what is it about their connection to one another that inspires them to fight for it? I think in, in, in the history of, I mean, the lore, history of elves and humans, and Tolkien, when it refers to Tolkien, it's only happened a few times, and it's and it's ended in uh, not so well. In, I mean, say tragedy, and yeah. and sometimes in tragedy, sometimes in death. So it's it's it ha it's happened very few times, and for very specific reasons, and that carries on our second age show as well. But in our show, um, without giving too much away, that's the thing. I mean, I have to answer the question like. Ah, like, ah, I don't you know? envy you today. You know, so I, I, I and then I, I'm trying to track it. Um, it, but in her show, I mean that that rings true as well. But um, there's also several layers of of why it's forbidden for us. Uh, I play out on Vera Sylvan Elf that has been tasked with watching over the people of the Southlands. You know, they and centuries ago they chose the side of evil, and then since then. We've been watching over these people, making sure that the law, you know, they stay, they stay put. You know, we've pretty much occupied their land. So that in and of itself creates this power dynamic between us that makes it also extra, extra forbidden. Okay. How about for you, Nazanin? What is what is something about Arendir that that maybe Bronwyn needs in her life right now, a specific quality that he has that's that's good for her at this point. I mean, it's really interesting because he has, as a person, the quiet strength that he brings to the screen as Arondir. And I think what is, the cliche is that the, the, the male character comes in and sweeps the woman off her feet and that she's demure and she's, you know, and this is the opposite of that. You've got someone, I, I feel like Bronwyn is the more vocal one. Arondir has that quiet strength. There's very- Demure the, as well. <laughs> Um, she's vocal and she's strong and she's sort of um, 
um, very frank and, and asks questions in a way that's direct. And, and here's this warrior, courageous warrior, who has a very quiet strength, who is an elf of very few words. Uh, everything is conveyed in looks and movement. And um, with me, there's uh, this, with Bronwyn, there's sort of um, that, that sort of in your face feistiness and fire that you see. And this equal footing of human without any magical powers and this elf with magical powers, despite the power differential between them is so fascinating. And I love that she's an empowered woman with this powerful elf. Well, she does have a, a particular uh, set of skills that is very important, even if they aren't powers like an elf might have. So what does it mean to be a healer in this world? And I guess, what are some of the defining elements about what it means to practice medicine in this realm? I mean, it's so interesting because I am, I was pre-med, so I have a degree in biology and I, I reson it resonates with me that she's also trying to liberate her people from, you know, the shadows of their past. And um, I'm an activist and I've done a lot of work for my homeland, Iran. Um, and so there's so much in her that I can relate to. And I think it's super important that when I when you look at the women of Iran, they are at the forefront of this movement towards freedom and democracy. And we call them Shirzan, which is lioness. So I tap into sort of my inner lioness when I play Bronwyn. Um, it means the world to me that she has the, the courage of her convictions um, and there's a fearlessness in both of them in exploring the other, the, the forbidden um, that I love. And, and you look at us and you think on screen that this elf and human should not be because they're so different and their worlds are so different. But there's a humanity that or there's a there's an underlying core value system that binds us and bonds us. Um, and that's a beautiful message for today's world, because you you should never judge a book by its cover. We have more in common than than divides us. What a beautiful description. I'll, I'll wrap with a question for both of you here. So you get the opportunity to play entirely original characters, which does sound very exciting from a creative perspective, but it also might be a little daunting given how beloved these characters and this world are. So what is something new that they each bring to this world that you're especially excited for viewers to see for the first time? But then on the other hand, what is something that you strove to do with your characters so they feel like natural extensions of this world we know? Yeah, I think the characters are written very much on the following the 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 legacy of Tolkien, you know. So it's uh, they belong there, you know. It wasn't just pulled out of different references. There, the lore is extremely deep and extremely detailed for for these characters to be formed in certain gaps or 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 from different references. So I think that took care of itself in that sense. The, the creators of the show did a great job at that. We researched very deeply in terms of that, but also, I mean, there was incredible possibility mm -hmm. in, 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 in bringing layers um, and, and perhaps grit, uh, humanity, and bringing soul to these roles. And because it's the medium of TV, as you said, you get to have more time to, uh, to sit and watch uh, and live and tether yourself and see yourself with these characters and what they represent and what they bring. Yeah, agreed. The past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. This could be the beginning of a new era. Owen, hey. I'll throw this one to you to kick us off here. So supposedly during the Second Age, the dwarves are in a very strong and powerful place. So can you kind of paint a picture for us of what high times in the dwarf kingdom look like at the very start of the series? Yeah, like, correct. You know, it's it's a golden age for Khazad's doom. So um, you see us um, trading a lot of, um, a lot of, metal um and rock and um it, it's you see the ins and outs of Khazad doom um water light and uh, a th very thriving world okay i'm eager to dig into that more Sophia, for you now, can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between Doran and Disa? not just what their personal dynamic is like but also how their approaches to politics in the kingdom differ too 
you know, they are so united. Um, what's so wonderful is that they want the same things. Um, they want the same things, but they um, challenge and throw ideas about how we are going to get there. Um, and that is led with a immeasurable amount of power and passion and love and heart um, uh, and unapologetic shows of emotion. They are very much in love um, and very much still have the hots for each other. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and so um, you were- What a will, power couple. There are, we're a power couple. Ooh, what a power couple. And we're not afraid to show it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's too early to play favorites, but I feel like that description kind of just made the two of you my favorites. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> so a easily. dwarf and a saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> Sold over here. How about when it comes to their interactions uh, with other kingdoms out there? At this point, do Dorne and Disa have any really strong feelings about, you know, what other individuals like Gil-Galad and Elrond and others are up to right now? Well, the, the traits of the dwarves is that they don't trust anybody mm -hmm. uh, on the outside of their own world. So um, that's, you know, that quality is very much still there. There are a, a few exceptions, um, which we'll find out. And that, um, but but we trade with the outside world as well, you know, mm -hmm. so so we kind of, we need each other. We need, we, we need the Middle Earth for, for Middle Earth to work. Everybody need each, needs each other. But we've already established you two have each other. And it sounds to me like that's all you need in the world. Yeah, well, yeah. that's true. That's true. <laughs> Always putting a silver lining on these tough times in these shows. So, Sophia, <laughs> one thing that I am especially eager to see play out here based on the footage we got to see was how the dwarves singing traditions are incorporated in the narrative. So are you able to tease that for us a little, how that all plays out into the, uh, the story here? Of course, there are um, there are many ways, um, uh, but one of them, uh, the one that sticks with me because um, uh, you know I, I got to excitingly, brilliantly play it, was that um, Princess Deedsa and uh, some of the dwarven women can resonate, um, and resonating is a method used whereby they draw sound from the depths of their dwarven soul to be able to only some female dwarves, uh, female dwarves that are in a position of power, possess that that. That, that superpower um, and they are able to speak to and gain knowledge from the materials around them so from the rocks from the stone from the waters from the gold you know they are able to hear what they need and also um, uh, be informed by their movements and so you will see um, Princess Deesa in all her vocal glory um, uh, 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 shining and, and, and resonating those powers. I'm especially excited for that part of this. For both of you now, can you give us a sense of some of the filming techniques used for, you know, scenes outside of the Dwarf Kingdom or when you're with other non-Dwarf characters? Because I know in the films they use things like forced perspective and also some digital effects. So what is the filming process for like for that like on Rings of Power compared to the film series? Well, those methods are, are, are still certainly in <laughs> um, because they are effective and useful. <laughs> um, but we, all, we we did all of them. We experimented every, with every avenue, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have a great team who wanted, you know, everybody was thriving for it to be the best that it possibly can. And that meant, uh, you know, what would help is that if we would have eye contact whilst 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 acting with each other. Sometimes, yes, of course, you can't avoid but look at a tennis ball and act with a tennis ball sometimes. <laughs> but um, but it's all part of the excitement. It, was, you, it felt like a little a little kid playing with toys, you know, when 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 those days and those tr um, tricks happened.